from World News Tonight. Border battles. First Pakistan and Afghanistan, now India and China as mounting border tensions cause geopolitical conflict. No hope. Ukraine says Russia has no plans of stepping away from the continuing conflict with new fears of nuclear action. Flash freeze. Heavy snow blankets all of UK causing travel chaos. And sparkling Sydney. Australia enjoys the Christmas season with creative illumination. This is Other There Are No World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News. We start off tonight with a reignition of age-old border conflicts. India says its forces have clashed with Chinese troops in a disputed area along the border. The first such flare-up in more than a year, the nations had been working to de-escalate tensions since a major clash killed at least 24 troops in 2020. The Indian Army said there had been a clash in the Tawang sector of Arunachal Pradesh state of eastern tip of India. Both sides were involved with a few soldiers suffering minor injuries. China's foreign ministry said that the situation at the India-China border was generally stable. However, an Indian Army source said that at least six Indian troops were injured. The Indian forces stated that both sides immediately disengaged from the area and added that commanders from both sides had held a meeting immediately after to restore the peace and tranquility. India's Defence Minister Rajnath Singh told the parliament that no Indian soldiers had been hurt or seriously injured in the clash and that the incident has been taken up at diplomatic levels. He added that because of timely intervention of Indian military commanders, PLA soldiers went back to their positions. China and India share a disputed 3,440-kilometre-long de facto border called the Line of Actual Control, or LAC, which is poorly demarcated. The presence of rivers, lakes and snow caps means the line can shift. The soldiers on either sides, representing two of the world's largest armies, come face to face at many points. Meanwhile, heavy shelling at the Pakistan-Afghanistan border on Sunday killed and injured dozens, including civilians, as relations continued to sour between the neighbouring countries. The clash was a result of a dispute over the construction of border checkpoints. At least six Pakistani civilians and one Afghan soldier were killed on Sunday in cross-border shelling and gunfire at the Pakistan-Afghanistan border. The clash took place near the Chaman border crossing which links Pakistan's southwestern province with Afghanistan's southern Kandahar province. The Pakistan army said Sunday that 17 people were injured and the casualties were due to unprovoked and indiscriminate fire on civilians. Pakistan's Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif said the deaths were unfortunate and deserve the strongest condemnation. In Afghanistan, a spokesman for Kandahar's governor said the clash started after Pakistani forces had demanded that the construction of new checkpoints on the Afghan side of the border should stop. Kandahar police confirmed that one Afghan soldier was killed and that 10 other people, including three civilians, were injured. A doctor at a hospital in Chaman told the Associated Press that live rounds injured 27 people brought in for treatment. An Afghan official in Kandahar told Reuters the situation had returned to normal after the two sides held a meeting. The crossing was closed for several days last month after similar clashes. A deadly shooting in November led to an eight-day closure, causing heavy commercial losses and leaving thousands of people stranded on both sides. Pakistan's foreign office said that Afghan authorities have been told that a recurrence must be avoided and the strictest possible action must be taken against those responsible. Peru's new president gave in to protesters' demands, announcing in a national televised address that she would send Congress a proposal to move up elections after thousands of protesters again took to the streets demanding she resign. Following a weekend of deadly clashes between police and protesters, Peru's new president on Monday said she would ask Congress to hold elections ahead of schedule, but maybe not soon enough to calm the unrest as the nation moves from crisis to crisis. President Dina Boluarte said she was seeking elections, but not for at least 15 months in April 2024. Boluarte was sworn in last week after Congress ousted former leader Pedro Castillo. Castillo was sacked and arrested for trying to dissolve the legislature and prevent an impeachment vote against him. But the moves against Castillo and Congress prompted Peruvians, many of them Castillo supporters, 
to demonstrate and demand that the people, not politicians, pick the country's leaders. Some chanted for Castillo to be reinstated. Dina Boluarte does not represent us. She is a traitor. She is incompetent. And now she should be in jail because there are already many dead in the country. We will continue until our president is released. Protests involving hundreds and at times thousands of people sprung up last week in cities in Peru's interior and capital, Lima, at times turning violent. Boluarte declared a state of emergency in the areas of high conflict, a measure that would allow the armed forces to take more control if necessary. Authorities say two teenagers were killed and four people injured on Sunday during protests. The violence wasn't limited to the street. Inside Parliament, one congressman tried to assault another. Peru has suffered intense bouts of political instability of late, with five presidents in just the last five years, all unable to complete their elected terms. The recently deposed Pedro Castillo is a former teacher and union activist, who won a narrow victory in 2021, boosted by poor rural and indigenous voters. His brief 17 months in office was marked by unprecedented turnover within his cabinet, as well as multiple corruption allegations which he called politically motivated efforts by right-wing members in Congress. Castillo, who has been under preliminary arrest since Wednesday, is being investigated by prosecutors for the alleged crime of rebellion and conspiracy. Potentially fueling Peru's protests, a strike by indigenous groups launched on Monday in the Apurimac region home to major copper mining operations. Peru is the world's second largest copper producer. Over on updates of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, Ukraine's deputy minister of defense speaking during a defense forum held in South Korea claims there is no possibility of a ceasefire in the war between Russia and his country. Bombardments continue between Ukraine and Russia as the war in its 10th month shows no end in sight. Just last week, Ukrainian drones struck two air bases deep inside Russian territory, to which Russia quickly retaliated with a massive missile barrage that struck homes and buildings, killing civilians. Amid worries that further escalations could make the war turn nuclear, Western countries have been expressing hopes of a ceasefire, suggesting Christmas as a date for Russian forces to withdraw. But Ukrainian Deputy Minister of Defense Volodymyr Gavrilov sees no end in sight for the war. During a defense forum hosted by the Korea Institute for Defense Analyses on Monday, he said as long as Russia is on Ukrainian territory, there will be no ceasefire. Russia is interested in ceasefire just to strengthen the other military posture in Ukraine. Until Russia is on our territory, there is no possibility of ceasefire. He also mentioned the worries about the war turning nuclear. I don't want to talk about nuclear. But if uh, the Russia decide to apply nuclear, of course, it's the most highest level of escalation in this conflict. But I hope it will never happen. Active support from Western countries has helped Ukraine fight back. In response to Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky's appeal to the virtual G7 meeting being hosted by Germany, the group of seven leaders vowed to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. The leaders of the world's wealthiest nations on Monday pledged their unwavering support, promising to meet Ukraine's urgent requirements. As the G7 leaders also called on their finance ministers to meet in the near future for discussions on supporting Ukraine in 2023. The European Union has agreed to add 2 billion euros to a fund used to help arm Ukraine as it seeks to ensure it can keep delivering weapons to Kyiv. The 27-nation bloc has drained a peace facility budget originally meant to last to 2027 in just 10 months of war as it has covered the cost of some arms being sent to battle back Russia's invasion. European Union foreign ministers have agreed to put another 2 billion euros into a fund used to pay for military support for Ukraine. The fund has been largely depleted after almost 10 months of war since Russia's illegal invasion. Meeting in Brussels on Monday, the ministers said further top-ups are also possible. We will assist Ukraine on repairing its energy system. We will increase our electricity exports to Ukraine. We will continue working to ensure accountability for all involved in this war in order to make impunity impossible. Ministers were also planning to discuss a ninth package of sanctions on Russia as well as new sanctions on Iran over its crackdown on anti-government protests. 
We consider unacceptable the use of capital punishment as a tool to repress the, the protesters. In the new package of sanctions for human rights violations, we are targeting those responsible for this continued repression against protesters. Twenty individuals and one entity were sanctioned over human rights abuses, while four more people and as many entities were added over the issue of drone supplies to Russia. Let's go for a short commercial break. More news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. Heavy snowfall blanketed parts of Britain, disrupting airports, train networks and roads, while two coal plants were put on standby in case of a power crunch as the country recorded its coldest night of the year so far. Parts of London's underground network were suspended or faced delays, while motorways were gridlocked due to snow. Magical scenes across the UK, while over the weekend, children made the most of the snow. But elsewhere, Britain's cold snap triggered travel chaos, with more than 50 flights cancelled at Heathrow Airport. And on Sunday, all flights at Stansted and Gatwick airports were grounded. There were also long train delays and motorways brought to a standstill. On Friday, the country's weather agency issued a level three weather warning, one step below a national emergency. The Met Office warned the sub-zero temperatures are expected to continue until Friday and advised people to heat their homes to 18 degrees Celsius. But many British households just can't afford to. In April, energy bills jumped by 54%, followed by a further 27% increase in October, and even more hikes are expected next year. But not heating homes in snowy weather also has a cost. In 2019, the British healthcare system spent almost 3 billion euros treating illnesses linked to living in cold, damp homes and records tens of thousands of extra deaths during the winter months. Meanwhile, the lobbying scandal that has shook the European Parliament now focuses on Greece's MEP and also Parliament Vice President Eva Kaili. The bloc is set to deliberate on whether she is to be stripped of her position in relation to the investigations. As MEPs continue to reel from the ongoing lobbying scandal, Belgian police have made fresh raids, including one on an European parliamentary office in a widening of the corruption investigation involving World Cup host Qatar. Belgium's Federal Prosecutor's Office said in a statement that since Friday, the IT resources of 10 parliamentary staffs have been frozen to prevent the disappearance of data necessary for the investigation. A total of 20 searches have been carried out since the beginning of the operations, including 19 in private homes and the one in the offices of the European Parliament. The EU's top politicians have strongly condemned the corruption scandal that is shaking the EU legislative body. The enemies for demo of democracy for whom the very existence of this parliament is a threat will stop at nothing. These malign actors linked to autocratic third countries have allegedly weaponized NGOs, unions, individuals, assistants and members of the European Parliament. Four people have been arrested and among them the European Parliament Vice President Eva Kaili. An extraordinary conference of presidents will be convened today to vote on whether to bring an end to Kaili's term under Article 21. That Qatar is a front rather in labor rights. She has already been stripped of her responsibilities as vice president. Doha has rejected any allegations of misconduct, saying that any association of the Qatari government with the reported claims is baseless and gravely misinformed. The U.S. Department of Energy is set to announce that scientists have made a breakthrough on fusion energy, the process that powers the sun and stars that could provide a cheap source of electricity one day. A potentially major scientific breakthrough in fusion energy that could one day provide a cheap source of electricity. According to two sources with knowledge of the matter, scientists at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California for the first time ever have produced a nuclear fusion reaction resulting in a net energy gain in an experiment using lasers. 
fusion works when nuclei of two atoms are subjected to extreme heat of more than 100 million degrees Celsius or 180 million degrees Fahrenheit, causing them to fuse into a new larger atom, giving off enormous amounts of energy, the same process that powers the sun and stars. But the process consumes vast amounts of energy, and the trick has been to make the process self-sustaining and to get more energy out than goes in, and to do so continuously instead of brief moments. If fusion is commercialized, which backers say could happen in a decade or more, it would have additional benefits including the generation of virtually carbon-free electricity, which could help in the fight against climate change, without the amounts of radioactive nuclear waste that today's fission reactors produce. We have some good news for you. Diabetes has been a prevalent illness across the globe and with rapidly developing technology, the means with which to deal with such an illness has become increasingly convenient. Now this effort takes it a step further with lenses that are capable of detecting blood sugar levels. A South Korean research team has developed a type of smart contact lens that can automatically check blood sugar levels by just wearing them. A small device placed near your eyes while wearing the lenses detects your current blood sugar level and immediately displays it on a smartphone. This smart lens consists of an antenna, a semiconductor chip, and a sensor that can measure blood sugar. In order to quickly absorb even a small amount of tears, a hydrogel that has numerous small pores on its surface is filled with a nanocatalyst to increase reaction speed and sensitivity. This enables the smart lens sensor to immediately check the user's glucose levels. Made in collaboration with a soft contact lens manufacturer, the smart lens can measure blood sugar, be worn all day, and even correct vision. Color lenses also have shapes, but they're invisible to the naked eye. As long as shapes don't block the passage or pupils, we cannot see them. The circuit we're making is also on the outside of the pupils, so it does not impair sight. After conducting clinical trials and experimenting on rabbits, scientists have confirmed that the smart lenses accurately measure glucose levels just as well as conventional meters. The research team has also succeeded in developing LED smart lenses that can prevent retinopathy, a complication of diabetes by allowing the developed lens to emit remedial light. They're also developing smart lenses that can directly administer corrective drugs to the eyes according to the blood sugar and measures. Aspen, a global multinational specialty pharmaceutical company, announced today that it would receive 30 million US dollars from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations to support its capabilities to manufacture vaccines for Africa. South Africa's Aspen Pharmacare has finalized agreements securing 30 million US dollars from the Gates Foundation and the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations. That's according to the company on Monday, which said the funds would be used to help make affordable vaccines for Africa. In August, Aspen announced a deal with the Serum Institute of India to make and sell four Aspen-branded vaccines for the continent, as it looked to use its near-idle COVID-19 vaccine production lines. Aspen said the 10-year agreement with Serum Institute would be supported by the funding from CEPI and the Gates Foundation. Each of the two will contribute $15 million. The Serum Institute agreement provides for Aspen to make and distribute four vaccines commonly administered in Africa. In August, CEO Stephen Saad said the contract gives Aspen certainty on volumes and will eventually cover an expected fall in revenue from its COVID vaccine contract with Johnson & Johnson. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Six people, including two officers, were killed in a gunfight at a remote property in Australia's Queensland state after police visited a home there to investigate a missing person report. Dozens queued while paramedics rushed the seriously ill into a fever clinic in eastern Beijing almost a week after Chinese authorities scrapped major COVID restrictions across the country. Drone video captured scores of migrants waiting near the border fence at El Paso, Texas after they crossed from Mexico. About 1,500 people crossed the Rio Grande overnight amid an increase in migrant arrivals in the area ahead of the expiry of a pandemic-era order that blocked them in the U.S.-Mexico border. 
Prime Minister Designer Benjamin Netanyahu pledged to balance out religious and secular interests in Israel as he tries to form a new government with nationalist and ultra-Orthodox Jewish parties. Supporters of far-right Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro attempted to invade the federal police headquarters in Brasilia, the capital, protesting the arrest of an indigenous leader in the first major flash of post-election violence. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you missed any of the stories tonight, you can watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash English. We leave you tonight with visuals of Christmas light displays lighting up across Sydney, enchanting and encouraging residents to enjoy the festive season in the heart of the Harbour City. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.